I don't care if God ever shows me that this is for my good. I get to believe it. It's part of me. It's down in my toes. It's what the Bible says. Don't take that away from me. If, if God takes all, it takes everything, leave me the scriptures and don't let me ever doubt them. Larry walked with me through a couple of dark spiritual valleys. He pointed me to God's abundant grace upon grace for me with no strings attached. Boy, did he ever love to talk about the good news of what Christ has done for sinners. He answered my endless questions with the love and grace of our Heavenly Father. I will always be grateful to him. Welcome to the Timeless Gospel Podcast. I'm your host, Faith Ann, and Larry Horton was my dad. The deepest connection I had with my dad was through his teaching of the gospel. My dad communicated grace more deeply and simply than most. These sermons came to be preserved through my dear Aunt Shirley, who, in the early 80s, requested that my dad's sermons be recorded on cassette tapes and mailed to her so that she could be edified from five states away. When Larry died and went home to be with the Lord in 2019, my Aunt Shirley came to the funeral and brought with her the very sermons this podcast was created to showcase. The remaining sermons were preached in the early 2000s at the church he pastored until he died. His children's prayer is that you will come to Christ through these sermons, or if you already are a Christian, be edified and comforted as so many were during his life. In episode 16 of the Timeless Gospel, Larry finally arrives at Romans 3.21, and he reads 3.21 through 3.25, and then goes back to the Old Testament to talk about the tabernacle. In the discussion part of the episode, I welcome back Daniel, and he and I talk about how important context is and why Larry spent so much time going back to the Old Testament in this sermon. Daniel and I had such a great discussion that I decided to break it up into two parts. So part one will be played this week, and part two will be played in the next episode. We'll finish the episode with Mandolin's arrangement on the piano of I Love to Tell the Story. Some exciting news, The Timeless Gospel is now on YouTube. It's The Timeless Gospel, that's the name of the channel, so you can find all the episodes uploaded there, and if you want to leave a comment, I would welcome that. As always, you can email me at thetimelessgospel at gmail.com. That's thetimelessgospel at gmail.com. The second part, Roman numeral 2 of our outline, we've been studying the condemnation of man. Now we're going to be looking at the justification of man. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. We'll be reading from 321 over to 325 this morning. We're just going to read it, look at it very briefly. We'll leave it for a couple of weeks, and we'll come back to it in a couple of three weeks and look at it more in depth. The scripture says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. Okay, now this is important. We want to put this, this paragraph in context then we'll look at it, uh, once we get it in context, it's going to take a couple of weeks. Once we do that, then we will look at it uh, word by word. But now, at the end of uh, verse 25, Paul says that God passed over sins previously committed. Now, at what time is he talking about there? Is he talking about during mine and your lifetimes? Has God ever passed over our sins that we previously committed? You don't believe so. Well, I, I don't believe so either. We were either sinners or we're saints. Uh, we've been washed in the blood or we haven't been washed in the blood. There, God did not pass over any of our sins. They've been dealt with at the cross. But there was a time when, when the sins were being passed over. And it was sometime when the sins were done, being done previously. So when would that time be, do you think? Just give me a guess. In Egypt. Oh, that is real close. Yeah, it really is. Think again. When was it that 
When was it? Okay, did, didn't we say in our outline that the word propitiation, and I, I realize that some feel I, I am pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, didn't we explain what that word meant? What does propitiation mean? Okay, it means mercy seat. It means mercy seat. We're going to look at that and look at that and look at that. We're going to look every way you can look at the mercy seat. Christ was our propitiation. Christ was our mercy seat. Where do we find the mercy seat? Where? Where? Speak up. The Passover feast. That's long in there. Just a little bit later, just like Penny was saying in Egypt, it's just a little bit to the right of Egypt. No. The mercy seat was found in the tabernacle, in the wilderness. True. It, you're right. It, in Sinai, you're absolutely, you're, that's absolutely correct. I stand corrected. Well, she didn't uh, put this on lightly. Okay, so now in the context of our verse, we have alluded to the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. Is that correct? In the fact that the word propitiation is used? Is that a fair statement? Okay. Does not Hebrews tell us that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin? Okay. We, we have a, a term in the church we call the particular atonement. Or we use the word atonement a lot in the church. Literally, that should not be used. That's not a, that is not a good word because atonement means covering. Our sins, your sin and my sin, have not been atoned for. They have not been covered. They have been taken away. But in, at this time, the Lord Jesus Christ had not come yet in the flesh. So God was previously overlooking the sins through the propitiation he was, he was going from year to year. The sins were being covered from year to year. The, the sins in, in one year were, were covered, were forgiven, but you had to go back the very next year and do the same thing. It was just simply a matter of, of discipline. God showing the children of Israel that where, <clears throat> that where sin reigns, death occurs. Where there's, sin, where, there's, where there's sin, there's death. Where there's sin, there's death. But the blood of the bulls and goats could not take away sin. But it was because there's no make-believe with God, there was a, the covering, there was the atonement. Now, in the Holy of Holies, there was this little box. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to look at that. We're going to really look, look into that next week. Inside the Ark, mainly, I want to bring up, was the, the Ten Commandments. Okay, now in the Ten Commandments, uh, that's, that's bad news. <laughs> that's real bad news because the children of Israel, as we all know, had broken all the Ten Commandments before Moses could ever get them down off the mountain. So this is going to be that the, the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God. It's where God was coming to dwell. We're going to look at next week that this very place right here, this very place was the basis of God's judgment. This was the foundation of God's judgment. They asked, they asked David, David, where are your gods? Where is your God, David? He said, well, my God is in the, is in the heavens. And, and that's true. And then we have other verses. It, David said, if I go to hell, their God is. If I go to heaven, their God is. God's everywhere. But on one day, literally, you could say, one day out of the year, God was literally right there, the top of that little box. He come all the way from glory down to be on top of that little box to sit in judgment. That little box is the basis for his judgment. Now, the mercy seat, now, if God's going to judge, he looks into that little box. The little box did not have a lid on it. God instructed to build this box, this ark, and inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. So now, God comes and sits in judgment on that ark. And he looks down and he sees the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. All he can do is condemn. No one can receive grace or mercy. No one can receive anything but judgment because God is looking into the Ten Commandments. But on top of the ark, on top of the little box, God instructed to build a mercy seat. And so a mercy seat was put, it, put around this little box of fine gold. And on top of the mercy seat, the priest would come in 
once a year into the Holy of Holies. We're going to learn all about this stuff. And he would sprinkle blood on that mercy seat. Now God would come down. God then does not look inside the ark. He sees the mercy seat on top of the ark and he sees the blood on top of the mercy seat. So God is now seeing blood. He can, he can forgive. He can set in judgment on the basis of the blood rather than the broken laws inside. Now, this whole era, this whole thing that we're going to talk about today centers around this little box. Everything that God designed around this thing is designed around this little box. We're going to get to it maybe next week, maybe the week after. But eventually we're going to get to this little box <laughs> and the mercy seat on top, and that'll take care of the word propitiation in verse 25 of Romans chapter 3. We will then have it in context, and hopefully by then when we read it, it will have greater meaning to us than it does today. So, so that is our object. Now, before we leave Romans 3, I hope this is going to work good, because I've got a lot of drawing to do today. Now, now let's go back to 321. We see two things that, uh, that, that would recommend us going back and looking at this tabernacle and where this little box was located. One is the, the word propitiation or propitiation, as some would say. That's the mercy seat. Well, where do we get the mercy seat? The tabernacle. It also talks about sins previous, previously committed. God covered sins. God overlooked sins previously committed. The only time that took place was in the wilderness of the Ark of the, uh, uh, of the Covenant, that one day a year, the Day of Atonement. So that sh those two items should lead us back to uh, this time. But going on further, putting this right dead in, the, in context, let's look at verse 21. But now apart from the law, apart means apart. Now, just totally forgetting about the Ten Commandments, setting that totally apart, not even thinking about the righteousness of God through the Ten Commandments, let's call that the law of Moses, okay? the moral law of God. But now apart from the moral law of God, but now apart from the law of Moses, the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's interesting what this word manifest means. It's, it's taken from two words, and it means it's as clear as someone hitting you in the nose with a fist. It's as clear as that fist is coming at you. You can see that fist. That fist is plain. You are aware of that, fi that fist. Now, the righteousness of God has been made that clear. But it's apart from the Ten Commandments. It's apart from the law of Moses. <clears throat> but it, this is where it gets a bit complicated. Being witnessed by the law. <laughs> it, the Bible is not mythical. It's true that, the, that God has to teach us. The Holy Spirit must teach us the truth of the Bible. But anyone with half a brain, you don't, it doesn't say one thing and means something else. It's not like the Eastern religion that, that up is down and down is up. It would seem like almost a paradox here or maybe that God is speaking in mysteries and God doesn't speak in mysteries. Uh, we are in, in this regard... Uh, our, our uh, salvation, our worship is based on a physical act that took place in history. There is more evidence outside of the Word of God. There is more evidence that Jesus Christ came and died and was raised from the dead than there is that Napoleon lived. We base our faith on an on a actual thing that took place in history. Nothing, nothing uh, mystical about it. But now what does it mean that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, being witnessed by the law. Well, let's turn to the law. Let's turn to uh, Exodus chapter 20. Here we have the Ten Commandments. And everybody is real big on the Ten Commandments, and they quit reading in verse 17. But let's read now in verse uh, oh, 24 of the same chapter. Verse 21, after God says, Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Uh, do this and live, uh, all these different uh, things we see in verse 24. You shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. Why? Why would they need a sacrifice if they obeyed the law? God says, don't do this, and if you don't do this, I'll bless you. And God says, do this, and if you do this, I'll bless you. In the very same breath, so to speak, God says, make an altar. 
and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, you sh your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. And if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. Don't, don't be making me pretty rocks and things to build an altar for me. Get out your tools and make it pretty. Because you just defile it because it's your, of your hands. I, won't, you know, I don't want anything to do with you and your works. But build an altar. But don't, if you use stones for your altar, that's fine. But just pick them up the way I created them. Don't be, going, don't be working on them. In verse 26, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. We do not go up by steps to God. We don't walk up to God. We come and we meet God at the altar. And we do not crawl up steps, walk up steps, or no steps to God. The, the only way to get to God is through the sacrifices. So this too is part of His law. Now, when God gave the Ten Commandments, just right immediately afterwards, he st well, not immediately afterwards, He talks, gives us uh, things to live by, <clears throat> uh, different principles to live by. Then He talks about the, the altar. Then He start, gives us instructions concerning this tabernacle and the priest, the priesthood and the tabernacle. Let's call that the law of Aaron. God gave Moses the law, but He had Aaron to, to, uh, to fulfill it. The, the ceremonial law. So we have the moral law of God, we'll call that the law of Moses. And we have the ceremonial law of God, and we'll call that the law of Aaron, just for our principles right here. So the righteousness, apart from the law of Moses, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law of Aaron. So we have three different reasons in Romans chapter 3 to come back to this, to this place. We have the word propitiation, we have the fact that God was covering sins. He was overlooking sins from year to year. And, and then we have the witness of the law. We're going to look at the righteousness of God being witnessed by the law. The law of Aaron, not the law of Moses. Okay, now with that in mind, let's, let's turn now to uh, Exodus chapter 25. <clears throat> then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. And this is the contribution which you are to raise from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet material. Fine linen, and goat hair. Ram skins, dyed red. Porpoise skins, kale wood. Oil for lighting, spices for the atoning oil. And for the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplates. And let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the furniture, just so you, will, you shall construct it. So God is going to give to Moses a pattern to construct the tabernacle. And this, this, is, this is where God is going to dwell. That's an amazing thing, that God is going to dwell there and nowhere else. The outlying communities of Israel, there were other people all over the world, but they had no access to God. Only Israel had a, a access to God because Israel was going to make a dwelling place for God. A dwelling place for God. It's where God dwelt. And keeping our fingers there, running quickly over to John, Chapter 1, don't, you don't have to turn there. We all know this, I'll read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being by Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. That's Christ. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The original language here says, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So the dwelling place of God is in the person of Jesus Christ. He tabernacled among us. So now when God gives this tremendous, uh, how, how to construct the blueprints on how to construct this, uh, this tabernacle, every single thing in the tabernacle is a picture of Christ.
Every single thing is a picture of Christ. Christ came and was our tabernacle. He tabernacled among us when he came. It's so amazing how our minds work and how much different our ways are than God's ways. Do you want to know how to make a million dollars? I know exactly how to make a million dollars. Anybody wants to do it? Go over in front of the pyramids in Egypt and set up a hot dog stand. I promise you, you'll make a million dollars. Because there are millions and millions of people that go over there and look at those pyramids. Or the catacombs in Rome. And yet, here we have 13 chapters on the tabernacle, and no one pays any attention to it hardly. How many chapters did God give us in creating the world? Two chapters. God created the whole universe in two chapters. And yet he spends 13 chapters here explaining about this tabernacle. This is important business that we're about. And if you could understand these 13 chapters, you would understand every single, every single area of salvation and justification. I mean, every single one. You wouldn't even need the New Testament. This is important stuff. There is more written about the tabernacle than any other subject in the Bible. It's just amazing that God put that much uh, importance to it and, and we ignore it. Okay, so now let's look at this briefly. I'm going to try to draw the whole thing out for you and then we're going to take it step by step. First of all, there was the outer court. And right here at the outer court, there was a, there was a gate. Right in front of the gate, in, just inside the gate, there was the brazen altar. Just a little bit past the brazen altar was the laver of water. Then there was the tabernacle. And here at the tabernacle, instead of the tab tabernacle, was a door. And separating the tabernacle was the veil. We're going to, you know, we know an awful lot about that veil, don't we? That was ripped from top to bottom when Christ died. All part of the plan. Right here, just, just inside the veil, just this side of the veil was uh, a table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the, 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 the light stands, seven pronged light candle stands. Just inside, right in the middle of this room, was that little box. The Ark of the Covenant. And top of the Ark of the Covenant was the, the, the mercy seat. And God spent 300, His Shekinah glory, you've heard of the Shekinah glory of God, was 365 days, it was right there. In the daytime, it, it looked like smoke. At the nighttime, it looked like fire. And every time that Shekinah glory took off, boy, the children of Israel packed up quick and they took off right after. God dwelt right there. God dwelt there. Christ came and, and tabernacled among us right there. The very first thing about this is very interesting. If you draw a straight line this way and that way, you've got the cross right there. That's just the first of it. So that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to be looking at right there is, is the tabernacle. These ladies back here, these, these fellows here, we expect you to, to be able to read. Uh, we expect you to be able to think think things and think through things, maybe not spiritual things, but we expect you to have a mind and you think through things. And we can teach you through the written word. But now these little ones over here, we don't teach them that way. We teach them through pictures. Well, God's got a tremendous story to tell us. A tremendous story, a tremendous story about salvation. And he tells it to us in the New Testament. But before he tells it to us, before he teaches it in his written word, he, he pictures it in the Old Testament. This is salvation right here. That is, if you, if you get all the theologians in all the world and they bring up all their, their words uh, concerning salvation, right here is what they're talking about. This is a picture of salvation right here. So God gives us pictures in the Old Testament before he teaches us in the New Testament. If you look over, and, and I've done a little math, if you'll look over, you don't have to turn there. Uh, verse 21 of chapter 38, you find what the materials that were, was used. And if you translate the, 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 the Hebrew words into English, you find several hundred, several thousand pounds of gold, several thousand pounds of silver. If you take it, if I took it last night, I multiplied it out, just the silver and just the gold on today's market. I cheated a little bit on the silver. I, I counted it as $10 an ounce. I think it's like seven and a half or something. Taking the gold, 
multiplying it out, it came to $21,800,000 for that. $21 million for a tent. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Father said. This tent was only 15 by 30. It wasn't much bigger than this room. It may not have been as big as this room. 15 by 30 cost $21,800,000 and that was just for the gold and just for the silver. I'm not counting all the brass and the bronze. It's where God dwelt. God, God dwelled there. The temple was in the wilderness. I mean, I'm sorry, the tabernacle was in the wilderness. And if you take the first part of the wilderness journeys and you take the last part of it away, you look at it, look at it, and it, at the, how long it took them to make it, the actual time that the, that the children of Israel used it was just under 34 years. The Lord Jesus Christ came and tabernacled among us for just under 34 years. It was the center of the camp. The tabernacle was the center of the camp. God instructed the 12 tribes of Israel to encamp around this. And the 12 tribes pushed right up against this curtain here we're going to look at in a minute. So they were backed up right to here, all the way around it. So the tabernacle was in the very center. It was in the midst of the people. Christ is in the midst where two or three are gathered gather together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. I am the center of them. The law was preserved in the tabernacle. And the law was preserved in Christ. This little room here, the holy place, that's where the priests ate. The, the holy place was where the priests ate. They were fed there, just as we are fed of Christ. Christ feeds us. There's one door. There's one door here. There's a gate here and a door there. Just one way in this place. Christ is the door. This I found very interesting. Told you that the 12 tribes went all the way around this thing. Right here, right here in front of this gate was the tribe of Judah. God instructed the children of Israel to back right up against this curtain. So you got, let's go over here, a tribe, bowl, oh, it doesn't matter, uh, Dan, whatever. And let's say you got some big shots. You got some real, the, the counselors, uh, the guys that are close to Moses. Uh, you got ordinary people, but you got some big shots too. But in order for these big shots or anyone else to worship God, to go where God was, they had to go through the tribe of Judah. Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Now what if, what if, and you could get this in my backyard, what if the only place on the planet to worship God was in my backyard? Ronald Reagan, Khrushchev, Cassius Clay, John Wayne, Billy Graham, everybody had to come to my backyard to worship. And they had to go through, and there was a seven-foot fence where they couldn't get over. They had to go through my house. Wouldn't that be humiliating? Wouldn't that be humiliating to come through my house to worship? They have to, no matter who they were, they'd have to belittle themselves and come through my house. And just no matter who these people were, they had to humiliate themselves and go through the tribe of Judah. Just like in salvation, we have to go through the tribe of Judah. Everything here is a picture of what happened to us spiritually. This is the tabernacle. This was in the wilderness for 35 or so years. Later, God instructed, uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Solomon to build a temple. In contrasting the tabernacle with the temple, the, the, the tabernacle was in the wilderness. Christ's first coming. He came and he had no place to lay his head. He, he was a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was in the wilderness. Uh, uh, but, but the temple was in the city of the great king in Jerusalem. And when Christ comes back, he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. <clears throat> there was no, God instructed, there was no floor to the tabernacle. Just sand. Everything in it, everything around it was God instructed to be built. But the floor, there was just sand. Uh, uh, you might could say that it, it, it would help the folks to not look down, but look up. Christ is not here on earth, in, in physical. He, he, we're not to be concerned with the earth. We're not to be concerned with, with things of this world. But we're to look up at the ceiling. We're to look out at the walls and the furniture. But in the temple, whew, it was, oh, the, the floor was overlaid with fine gold. Man, that, that temple floor was expensive. 
And people could very well look down, picturing Christ coming back as king to rule and reign forever and ever and ever. So this is what, this is what we're going to be looking at for the next couple of weeks. Now, the first thing we need to look at, let's turn to, uh, let's turn to, to Exodus 27. And I'm going contrary to, to the way God's got this. I hope it's okay. God instructed, God gives us instructions on how to build the, 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 the tabernacle from the inside out. Starts with the Ark of the Covenant and gets all the way back out to the priests. And if I may have the liberty, I'm going to start from the outside and work in. Let's look at verse 9. The court. And you shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side there shall be hangings for the court and fine twisted linen, 100 cubits long for one side. So we got 100 cubits down this side. And its pillars shall be 20 with their 20 sockets of bronze. Hooks of <clears throat> the hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be of silver. And, and that's a picture of Christ. I don't have time to get into it now. And likewise for the north side in length there shall be a hanging 100 cubits long. Okay. We're going to get on the north side 100 cubits. Verse 12, And for the width of the court of the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits. Okay, the west side is 50 cubits. With their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. And the width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits. Now, on the east side, God further tells us, He tells us to, to, to build this fine linen all the way around this thing. But in the front, He only tells us to build a fine linen for 30 feet. 30 feet here and 30 feet there which leaves 20 feet. Uh, by the way, a cubit is a foot and a half. So you got 150 feet by, or uh, yeah, 150 feet by 75 feet and half, half of that. So right in the center here, you have the gate. The gate, I believe he calls it 20 feet, 20 cubits. And the gate is on the east side. So whenever they set this thing up, the gate was on the east side. Now, the, the linen... The tents were made, all these tents all the way around here were made mostly out of goat hair. And even today, they're still being made out of goat hair. And they, they turn out brown and black. So you've got these jillions of tents all the way around here, enough to house 603,550 men over 20. So that's a lot of tents. With their wives and families. They're all brown. But right here, you've got fine linen all the way around this thing. Except it's a gate, and that's purple, scarlet, blue. So right in the middle of all this brown and black, you have this white linen, meaning the right, this white's always, a, in, in Revelations it talks about the white linen, talks about the righteousness of Christ. Here is the righteousness of Christ here. And you can't get inside because the righteousness of Christ is, is holding you out. It's seven and a half feet high. The only way to get in is here. And once you're in, you're in. The righteousness of Christ will keep you in. And at the front of this thing, at the east side, was the door, was the gate. Now let's turn to Genesis Chapter 3 for a moment. We know the story well. Let's go to verse 22 of chapter 3. After God kicks Adam out of the garden. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Boy, there's a lesson there. And now lest, and we'll get into that in Romans. And now lest he stretch out his hand, and take also from the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate, cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Most everyone has agreed that the cherubims were there to guard the way back. Adam could not come back and eat of the tree of life. And this guard was at the east of Eden, on the east side of Eden. Here we have the gate on the east side. It was always on the east side. So God has provided a way for Adam to get back to the tree of life through the east, going through the gate. That's the importance of God telling us that the gate was on the east side. Let's turn over, if you will. Let's do some more math. Chapter 38, verse 26. Talks about the cost of the tabernacle. Abeka ahead. That's half a shekel. According, now, shekel, by the way, <laughs> do you know how much a shekel is? It takes two men to lift 100, 100 shekels. It takes two men to lift 100 shekels. A becca head, that is half a shekel. Just about all the silver one man could, could lift. 
according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for each one who passed over to those who were numbered from 20 years old and upward for 603,550 men. Now, this stops the controversy of how many men left Egypt. Because we know that none died to this point. So there were 603,550 men left Egypt. I don't know how many women, I don't know how many children, but I do know in this, in this outer court, women were allowed in this outer court. No one was allowed inside the temple, inside the tabernacle, except the tribe of Levi. And nobody was allowed inside the Holy of Holies except the high priest, Aaron, and him only once a year. But all you had to do was be an Israelite to get to there in this outer court. So we're looking at 603,550 men Multiply that times four, figuring one woman and two children. You got about a quarter of a million people. Now this this outer court is exactly the dimensions of a half of a football field. Right? It is. It's exactly half of a football field. Now let me ask you this. How many people can you get on a football field? Can't get very many, can you? I mean, you get a lot compared to what's in this room. But you can't get 603,550 men, their wives and their children, on a football field. And yet we don't find anywhere in Scripture where this was too small. You see, the 12 tribes of Israel were all around and about. And they all knew all about the gate. They knew all about the gate. Just inside the gate was a brazen altar. That's where the blood was shed. They didn't care. They didn't go in. We have no place in the Scripture showing that this was ever overcrowded. Yes, the priest could only go in the, little, in, the little, in the little tent. But anybody could go in here if they were Israelites. And we find nowhere where it was overran. The people didn't care. They knew all about the gate. It was their gate. God had instructed their prophet to build that gate. And they could tell you anything you want to know about that gate. But they weren't interested enough to go inside the gate. We are truly a little flock. Christ said we are a little flock. We have all kinds of people that know all about the gate. Different denominations, whatever the background, different personalities, different preachers, different teachers. They can tell us anything we want to know about the gate. They can tell us anything we want to know about this Bible. They know it frontwards, backwards, and upwards and downwards, but they have never went through the gate. Just a few went through that gate. That, that guy that wrote that song, he knew how to worship God, whoever he was. He says, in, in the morning, in the morning I will meet you just inside the eastern gate. That's the significance of this. So the gate was there, and it was the only way in. It had to go through the tribe of Judah. They didn't bother with it. They didn't bother with it. The little flock, they went in, and there was plenty of room for them. Typifying. Just, just, just a, a small group of people are concerned about Christ who have entered into Christ. Okay, now we come to the first part of the furniture. That's the, the, the brazen altar. The brazen altar is where you... Let's read it. <clears throat> Verse 1 of chapter 27. And you shall make the altar of a K of wood five cubits long and five cubits wide the altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. It's very clear exactly the dimensions of this of this uh, brazen altar. And you shall make it horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be on the shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. The horn signifies the strength of our Lord, the strength of our Lord in staying on that cross. The horns held him to that cross. He was the one who held himself on that cross. He said, if you're the Son of Man, you're the Son of God, come off that cross. He wouldn't do it. The thing that held him there was his will. The thing that held him there was his love for his elect. The thing that held him there was, was his uh, character. Strong strength. The horns of the altar were holding him there. Verse 4, And you shall make for it a grating of network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings and in four corners. And you shall put it beneath, under the ledge of the altar, that the net may reach halfway up the altar. There was, there was, as we know, a place for the sacrifice. And Christ not only was that sacrifice, but Christ was the, it, this is the picture of our, of our Lord. 
He was on that cross. He was the sacrifice. He held the sacrifice in his will and in his love. But inside this brazen altar, in the middle of it, right in the middle of it, there was a grate. And you put the you put the, the, the sacrificed animal up on top and the grate would, would, would keep it there. You would burn it. It would turn into ashes. You take the grate out, the ashes would fall down and then you deal with the ashes which is also a type of Christ. But I want to deal with that great. It was in the inside of this brazen altar. We think so much of, of the fact of how Christ suffered on the cross physically. And he did. The nails, the spear, the crowns, the lashings. And for three hours he suffered on the cross. But he was not suffering on that cross for only three hours. He suffered on that cross for six hours. And after the third hour, darkness filled the earth because God could not look upon this work, this strange work that he was doing. And there, Christ suffered for the sins of the, of the elect, the sinless one being condemned by the Father. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And in the inside, in the innermost part of Christ, he suffered that inward death. Not just the outward physical death, but that inward death for our behalf. And next, and one I want to close with today, is the labor. Here was washing. Now, now here only the priests, this is important, guys, only the priests could wash. This was not for the children of Israel. This was only for the priestly tribe, Levi. Only the priests could wash here. Here, there was sacrifice made. There was blood shed. There was forgiveness. But here there was water. And the priest, and only the priest, had to wash before they went into the tabernacle. There's two washings in Scripture. There's two washings in salvation. And we only think about the one. We only think about the blood. But there is two, and this is so, so important. Yes, we have been washed in the blood of Christ, and we are, we are, we are sinless. And we're justified and we're saved. But we need that washing every day. We are priests. We are priests of God. And we need to come to Christ, the laver. And in the labor, there's no dimensions. doesn't say a word about how big it should be, how small it should be. It's complete. It's total. Because it, it washes all, all of the saints, all of the priests whom we become. Let's turn to John 13 and we'll quit. John 13. I'll make this very brief. Verse 22, I guess. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking to the temple of Solomon. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, that's the wrong chapter, isn't it? 13. Here we go, verse 5. Now let's go to verse 4. Verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from, the, from God, was going back to God, rose from supper, and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. Then he poured water into the basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and said to him, now this is important, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you, what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Now here we, we're, we're taught, and it's true that it's here, of humility. The humility of Christ in washing the disciples' feet. But Peter understood that. He said, not me, Lord. You're not going to wash my feet. He understood the humility. But here it says that what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand later. So the, 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 the teaching here of Christ is not humility. I mean, it's here, but that's not the main thing that Christ is teaching us. It's not that we're to be humble, which we are. There's something of much more significance that Peter would understand later when the Holy Spirit came. Verse 8, <clears throat> Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. You're not going to wash my feet, ever. Jesus answered him, and we don't quote this for salvation, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, I thought all you had to do was believe in the shed blood of Christ to be saved. There's, there's another washing. 
I'm not going to divide this up and separate it out and, and get it down where our little finite minds can understand it. My point is there are two washings. There are two washings here. There are two washings when Christ taught. And there are two washings today. There is salvation and there is sanctification. And they happen exactly the same way. One, you're washed in the blood. The other, you're washed in the water. But you're washed totally by Christ. Christ is our justification. Christ is our sanctification. And we must be, he must wash our feet daily. Or we're not saved. We have no part with him. It's, salvation is not a one-time commitment. Salvation is a daily routine. We're washed in the blood once and forever, but we're cleansed by the water daily. Welcome to the discussion portion of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Daniel back on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So uh, we both, Daniel and I both listened to the sermon and we're really impressed. I don't know if impressed is the right word, but thankful that Larry is taking the time to show the listeners or his audience at the time the importance of the Old Testament as it relates to the New Testament and the pictures as they relate to the reality that the Roman Roman Christians would have been reading. The direction this discussion is going to go in is very much tied to what Larry is doing for the next three weeks. So we have th this sermon and then two more sermons that center around the Old Testament pictures before he even comes back to Romans 21 through 25. Is that about right? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's five verses. He's, he's, turned the corner now from God's judgment and condemnation, and now we're going to look at salvation. And so he's setting up these first five verses, and he says it's going to take three weeks to get it set up. And, you know, the, the listener may hear that and think, well, it's it's five verses. What What could possibly be there that's going to take three weeks of talking? Um, and that was something that Larry really pressed home uh, in his ministry at all times is um, keeping things in their proper context. We, we so misunderstand things when we fail to do that. And it's easy to do. It's easy to fail at, at getting to the context. And so that's why he would spend so much time making sure that the context had been laid out before getting into the meat of those verses. Yeah. And I bet you, you know, there weren't, there aren't very many pastors of just your fundamental churches that could even tell you what the word propitiation means. I mean, it's just, and what does it mean? The Levitical law, the, the law of Aaron and the law of Moses, um, because you can fly through Romans one, two, three so quickly and just look at it in one stroke and say, yeah, we're, we're under judgment and not really go into what propitiation means. Mm -hmm. What is the mercy seat? How God would come down once a year and dwell in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. And that mercy seat had blood on it because he was looking down into the Ten Commandments. And you can't, he, the blood is what stayed the wrath right. and and atonement the difference between atonement and true forgiveness all of that came out a little bit in this set, this lesson and will come out in the following weeks so important to understand right and and even for your christian i mean we're not talking about people who just go to theological seminaries or seminaries but the the 10 year old sitting in the pews should understand this as well right right and there's a depth there's a depth to scripture that you're just not going to get to um, in a in a passing remark about the first five verses of uh, um, or twenty one through, through twenty five. Um, and you know, a lot of I, th I think there are a lot of um, pastors out there, even well meaning pastors, that have bought into this idea that. Their audience, I, I only have them for, let's say, an hour a week, 
And so I, I've got to, I've got to just, you know, keep their attention. Um, and I, I can't spend it. I can't, um, linger for any length of time. I've got to keep the, the, the progress going, the excitement up and all of that. And so it's a very super, it can be a very superficial thing that they're, that they're giving to their audience. And, um, you know, they've bought into the idea that their audience is shallower than they are. And I, I, I think it, they're doing their congregations a disservice to, to think of them that way. Now, we, we do have shorter attention spans, and maybe some of that is due to technology and um, the, the bombardment of information that, we, that we're faced with today. But I don't want to, I don't want to go down a level. I want, I want, I don't want to come down to that level. I want them to come up to a higher level. Okay. Um, your attention span is shorter as you're scrolling through TikTok. but Sunday, let's put on our big boy pants and, um, pay attention on a level that maybe you don't during the week. 100%. That is why, uh, as a child, I, I didn't go into Sunday school very, very few and far between in the church. If I was in a Sunday school class, like as looking at the flannel graphs on the mm-hmm. flannel board, that means that dad wasn't the pastor. He was just teaching <laughs> because right. if he's pastor, we're not doing that where kids are in church and whatever, and whatever God decides to give them, he gives them. And it, again, it goes back to, I said last week, we aren't God's secretary. We, we're not the Holy Spirit's secretary. This is the Word of God. And, and like you said, let's not limit what the preached Word can do right. by deciding beforehand to water things down or to not take the time. And Larry, I'm, uh, this this book of Romans, I mean, years. He, he spent a couple of years in Romans because of that reason. I'm not in charge of this. This has to be uh, taught properly. Right. In context. In context. So uh, sometimes the tapes uh, cut off. You know, I don't have a lot of, I have no control over what's on the tapes. For the most part, um, Dad and his little tape, tape recorder there at the pulpit push and play is just fine. But sometimes uh, I can tell there's more but it didn't get recorded. The tape ran out. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are uh, under 25, you won't have any idea what that means, but us oldies will understand the tape ran out. So I did, we're going to do a couple things on this discussion. Um, we had talked about it, and you brought up a great idea, and I, I agreed. We'll briefly talk about uh, John 13, the daily cleansing, as it relates to 1 John 1, 9, because I... It, Larry wasn't either. It didn't get said, which I what I I mean, it didn't get recorded, or he's going to do it next week, and I don't know which of those is it is, because I had a question about it, and then we uh, are going to stray a little bit from Romans only to show how important context is, and give a few examples of verses that are grossly misused, verses that are used to press down the Christian and to scare the Christian, and to not give a Christian the proper understanding of the Lord and His sovereignty. So I have, we have three or four examples. We'll t- depending on how long this goes, we'll, we'll go that direction for this discussion. Uh, so Larry talks about a second or a daily cleansing as it relates to Peter and the washing of the feet in John 13. So you're up. <laughs> What do you think of that? Well, it, I, I, I have struggled with this passage um, to some degree, and I think um, most people would. Am I, am I clean or am I not clean? That, that's the question that, that I think gets brought up. Um, and Christ makes it clear, uh, you, you have been cleaned, you have been washed, and you are clean all over. And so I think that um, is pointing us to our forgiveness, our total forgiveness of all of our sins. Um, 
and and that doesn't change that doesn't go away that is never minimized or or decreased in any way um but then jesus talks about the need for uh, the feet to be washed still and i think that has to do with the um, the daily walk that the christian uh, all christians go through um, where our feet are soiled we are we are clean but in our daily walk um, we are soiled uh, by walking through this world and um, we need cleansing from that um, not in a legal sense, because that was dealt with um, in my justification. Um, I, am, I stand before God holy, blameless, beyond reproach. Um, and so I don't think that this foot washing is representative of anything, um, l any legal requirement or need that I have before God. It, it, it has to do with more of a, um, a temporal cleaning. Um, in this life, my my conscious my consciousness um, as I'm as as I sin um, in my daily walk, uh, how how does that get dealt with? Um, and it, it, it's not for legal purposes again, but it's it's mainly for for my sake um, that that I I can know even even in my daily walk my daily sinning that. Um, there is a God has provided a way for even that to be dealt with in my own mind for my own comfort. Um, and so I, I think that that's what's being pictured in John 13. And um, there is a, a way in which I think this is understood by a lot of Christians. Um, and it's connected with 1 John 1, 1 9. And I, I think that that is uh, one of these verses that can be taken out of context or that is being taken out of context when it's connected with uh, John 13 in the, in the foot washing. Um, of course, John 1, 9 is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that verse is taken up and out of 1 John and left to, to stand on its own apart from the overall context of first John. And so then it's connected back to John 13 and saying, well, this is the cleansing that's being talked about there in John 13, the daily cleansing, the foot washing. And so as we go through our daily walk and we sin, um, we, we are to confess those sins and, because we've confessed those sins, Jesus is faithful to cleanse us of those sins. Um, and I, I, I think that's an unfair reading of 1 John 1.9. Um, and for several reasons, but um, first and foremost, it, it has this cleansing being um, activated by me. Right. And my confession of my sin. Um, it's not a work. It's not really a work of Christ because He doesn't do it unless I confess. So it's it's really my work that I'm doing there. If I, if if my confession is the thing that activates Christ to cleanse me, um, and and so I, I think that's unscriptural. It's unbiblical. It it is um, against other clear teaching in the Bible, and so I think that should be avoided. It ignores the context of first john where it was false teachers that were in view here the reason john was writing this letter was to deal with false teachers namely the gnostics who um, had a very very low view of sin um, to the point where they did not confess that they were sinners mm -hmm. and that's what's being dealt with here John in first John is dealing with those people who did not attribute sinfulness to themselves. Mm -hmm. And John is saying, no, Christians are those who know that they're sinners confess out loud. I'm a sinner, but it did not have anything to do with this ritualistic daily moment by moment 
in a almost a ceremonial way confession of each and every sin. Right, a slot machine approach. Yes, I'm just ticking the box. Mm -hmm. um, I'm required to confess all of my sins, and so I'm going to tick that box every chance I get. Or even worse, you know, uh, I I better not uh, forget, or I'm not going to be forgiven for that thing that I did yesterday. That's it. That 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 that's another problem with interpreting First John one nine this way is those sins that I don't confess. Well, guess what? I'm not cleansed of those sins. Right. Just. Contrary to everything, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, John, Christ himself uh, taught. That's right. And so I, I don't, I'm not saying that um, continual confession of, of your sins is not an appropriate thing to do. I think it is an appropriate thing to do. But it's, it's, it's that genuine confession that comes from the heart where I'm so appalled at my own sinfulness, I cry out to God and confess, God, I, I recognize this as a sin. I recognize myself as a sinner. Um, I'm not checking, I'm not merely checking a box here. I, I, I can't help but openly, out, outwardly say to God and agree with God, this is sin. Um, that kind of continual confession of sin is what Christians do without even really being able to help themselves. That's a work of the Spirit in, in the sinner, in the believer. Um, I'm in agreement with God that this is sin. Yeah, and sometimes if you have a sin that you aren't confessing, um, and really I like the word recognizing more than confessing, then you could have something in your life that can't, that needs to be dealt with. And so confessing it is the very first right. step um, led by the Holy Spirit, of course. Uh, but if we don't know what we're doing, we don't see some particular act as sin, and but it is sin, We can it can affect our lives and the lives of people around us. Right. But we're not repenting of sin so that we, well, repenting is not a good word for that, right? Um, I, 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 we are called to repent of our sins, but it's not, um, it, it's, it's not that, uh, there's any kind of legal justification, um, that still remained that is now dealt with because I repented. Um, it, it is still just a, an agreement with God that it is sin and a desire and, um, a, a a purposing to turn away from that sin. Um, now we all struggle with sin, and so when when that actually takes place is up to God's work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like the uh, the little boy that played marbles um, with the other little boys. At some point, he just grew up and stopped playing marbles and started playing football. He left playing marbles behind, and um, that's that's how our, these sins are dealt with in our lives. Is we we grow out of them, we grow out of them by the Spirit causing us to grow up. It's not the um, mere effort of of just my will mm -hmm. um, causing myself to. Any any Pharisee can do that. I I can cause myself to not do the the action of this sin. Um, but has it dealt with the heart? Mm. And the answer is no. And that, that can only be done by the Spirit. And so he grows us up out of these sins. And part of that is our repentance of those sins. But overall, overarching though, we still want to remember it's not to get closer to God. No. In no. our sanctifying, in our Christian life. It's just a change, God working in us, the Holy Spirit working in us to change our desires. Right. And how do you line that up with Romans six, R real quick? Yeah, I, I think it, it. Romans six and seven is only um, understandable by uh, differentiating who is being spoken of there. Paul says "I" um, in several different ways. There, one is referring to his um, the old man. 
um, the other way is referring to his new man. And, and so Paul is still identifying himself with both of them, um, but there's a distinction to be made. The more we identify ourselves with the new man, the, the more these, uh, the work of the old man is dealt with. Um, that, that's a big part of the problem why people struggle with ongoing sin is they're still not believing Mm -hmm. that God has done what he's done. It's too good. It's just too good to believe. I have been wanting to tell this story for a couple of months now, and you just said something now I think it would be very well put right here, right after what you just said. The movie Trading Spaces or Trading Places, I can't remember what it's called. It's, It's one of those. Trading Places, I think. Trading Places. Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. And then you have the two old geezers, the rich old geezers, and they decide to place a bet for one dollar to see nature nurture. So they see Eddie Murphy uh, pretending to be blind and lame, uh, conning the lights out of his uh, people around him on their way to, you know, their Wall Street uh, office. And they notice that. And then, of course, when they get up to their nice, rich, fancy Wall Street office, they have a protege of of sorts, Dan Aykroyd, the young, up-and-coming executive who has the penthouse. And they decide, what if we traded them? And what if we uh, manipulated both of their lives? And so that now Dan Aykroyd is homeless and publicly shamed, and Eddie Murphy is now... uh, Taking essentially taking the role of the young protege has the the world is his oyster, right? So Eddie Murphy is in in Dan Aykroyd's house, and I, one of them's name's Randall. I can't remember the other one. The two old men are trying to convince Eddie Murphy that the house belongs to him, and he is Eddie Murphy saying, "What's behind? Look over there!" And as they turn their heads, he's stealing the candlesticks and the picture frames and the things of value. And this goes on for a couple of minutes. And finally, one of the old men says, "Um, every time you do that, you're stealing from yourself. This belongs to you. And sure enough, as he took on that identity, he he started acting more and more like the executive. And at the end of the movie, you can't tell the difference between Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Because he finally believed his new identity. He took it on and Amen. said, this is me now. And that's what, we, that's what the Christian life is. That's what Romans 6 is about. That, yeah. That, that's the very thing Paul's trying to get to is you, you need to see yourself as crucified in Christ and risen in Christ. That's you. The old man was put to death. All that he had, all that he was, has been dealt with fully and finally. And what was raised up is not a mixture of the two. It's a brand new man, a brand new person. No overlap, even a little bit. Right, right. So that's why the context is so important. We don't want to be seen as ignoring Scripture. Right. So that's why this is so important. Um, So thank you for that explanation. I think I think it's a good matching of the two, but even though you said we don't, they don't mix, but it's a good explanation of the two.
you for listening to the Timeless Gospel Podcast.